Chapter 1 of Strange Pages from Family Papers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer Recorded by David Barnes, Lizzie Driver, Corrie Samuel, and Peter Yearsley Chapter 1 Fatal Curses May the grass wither from thy feet, the woods deny thee shelter, earth a home, the dust a grave, the sun his light, and heaven her god. Byron, Cain. Many a strange and curious romance has been handed down in the history of our great families, relative to the terrible curses uttered in cases of dire extremity against persons considered guilty of injustice and wrongdoing. It is to such fearful imprecations that the misfortune and downfall of certain houses have been attributed, although, it may be, centuries have elapsed before their final fulfilment. Such curses, too, unlike the fatal curse of Kehama, have rarely turned into blessings, nor have they been thought to be as harmless as the curse of the Cardinal Archbishop of Rheims, who banned the thief, both body and soul, his life and forever, who stole his ring. It was an awful curse, but none of the guests seemed the worst for it, except the poor jackdaw, who had hidden the ring in some sly corner as a practical joke. But if we are to believe traditionary and historical lore, only too many of the curses recorded in the chronicles of family history have been productive of the most disastrous results, reminding us of that dreadful malediction given by Byron in his Curse of Minerva. So let him stand, through ages yet unborn, fixed statue on the pedestal of scorn. A popular form of curse seems to have been the gradual collapse of the family name from failure of male issue, and although there is perhaps no more romantic chapter in the vicissitudes of many a great house than its final extinction from lack of an heir, such a disaster is all the more to be lamented when resulting from a curse. A catastrophe of this kind was that connected with the McAllister family of Scotch notoriety. The story goes that many generations back, one of their chiefs, McAllister Indry, an intrepid warrior who feared neither God nor man, in a skirmish with a neighbouring clan captured a widow's two sons, and in a most heartless manner caused them to be hanged on a gibbet, erected almost before her very door. It was in vain that, with well-nigh heartbroken tears, she denounced his iniquitous act, for his comrades and himself only laughed and scoffed, and even threatened to burn her cottage to the ground. But as the crimson and setting rays of a summer sun fell on the lifeless bodies of her two sons, her eyes met those of him who had so basely and cruelly wronged her, and, after once more stigmatizing his barbarity, with deep, measured voice she pronounced these ominous words, embodying a curse which McAllister Indry little anticipated would so surely come to pass. "'I suffer now,' said the grief-stricken woman. "'But you shall suffer always. You have made me childless, but you and yours shall be heirless for ever. Never shall there be a son to the house of McAllister.' These words were treated with contempt by McAllister Indry, who mocked and laughed at the malicious prattle of a woman's tongue. But time proved only too truly how persistently the curse of the bereaved woman clung to the race of her oppressors, and, as Sir Bernard Burke remarks, it was in the reign of Queen Anne that the hopes of the house of McAllister flourished for the last time. They were blighted for ever. The closing scene of this prophetic curse was equally tragic and romantic. For, whilst espousing the cause of the pretender, the young and promising heir of the McAllisters was taken prisoner, and with many others put to death. Incensed at the wrongs of his exiled monarch, and full of fiery impulse, he had secretly left his youthful wife, and joined the army at Perth that was to restore the pretender to his throne. For several months the deserted wife fretted under the terrible suspense, often silently wondering if, after all, her husband, the last hope of the house of McAllister, was to fall under the ban of the widow's curse. She could not dispel from her mind the hitherto disastrous results of those ill-fated words, 
and would only too willingly have done anything in her power to make atonement for the wrong that had been committed in the past. It was whilst almost frenzied with thoughts of this distracting kind that vague rumours reached her ears of a great battle which had been fought, and ere long this was followed by the news that the pretender's forces had been successful, and that he was about to be crowned at Scone. The shades of evening were fast setting in, as, overcome with the joyous prospect of seeing her husband home again, she withdrew to her chamber, and, flinging herself on her bed in a state of hysteric delight, fell asleep. But her slumbers were broken, for at every sound she started, mentally exclaiming, Can that be my husband? At last the happy moment came when her poor, overwrought brain made sure it heard his footsteps. She listened. Yes, they were his. Full of feverish joy, she was longing to see that long absent face, when, as the door opened, to her horror and dismay, there entered a figure in martial array, without a head. It was enough. He was dead. And with an agonizing scream she fell down in a swoon, and on becoming conscious only lived to hear the true narrative of the Battle of Sheriff Muir which had brought to pass the widow's curse that there should be no heir to the house of Macalister. This story reminds us of one told of Sir Richard Herbert, who, with his brother, the Earl of Pembroke, pursuing a robber band in Anglesey, had captured seven brothers, the ringleaders of many mischiefs and murders. The Earl of Pembroke determined to make an example of these marauders, and, to root out so wretched a progeny, ordered them all to be hanged. Upon this, the mother of the felons came to the Earl of Pembroke, and upon her knees besought him to pardon two, or at least one, of her sons, a request which was seconded by the Earl's brother, Sir Richard. But the Earl, finding the condemned men all equally guilty, declared he could make no distinction, and ordered them to be hanged together. Upon this, the mother, falling upon her knees, cursed the Earl, and prayed that God's mischief might fall upon him in the first battle in which he was engaged. Curious to relate, on the eve of the Battle of Edgecote Field, having marshalled his men in order to fight, the Earl of Pembroke was surprised to find his brother, Sir Richard Herbert, standing in the front of his company, and leaning upon his pole-axe in a most dejected and pensive mood. "'What?' cried the Earl. "'Doth thy great body?' For Sir Richard was taller than any one in the army. "'Apprehend anything, that thou art so melancholy? Or art thou weary with marching?' that thou dost lean thus upon thy pole-axe. "'I am not weary with marching,' replied Sir Richard. "'Nor do I apprehend anything for myself, but I cannot but apprehend on your part, lest the curse of the woman fall upon you.' And the curse of the frantic mother of seven convicts seemed, we are told, to have gained the authority of heaven, for both the earl and his brother Sir Richard were defeated at the Battle of Edgecott, were both taken prisoners and put to death. Sir Walter Scott has made a similar legend, the subject of one of his ballads, in the Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border, entitled The Curse of Moy, a tale founded on an ancient Highland tradition that originated in a feud between the clans of Chattan and Grant. The castle of Moy, the early residence of Mackintosh, the chief of the clan Chattan, is situated among the mountains of Invernessia, and stands on the edge of a small gloomy lake called Loch Moy in which is still shown a rocky island as the spot where the dungeon stood, in which prisoners were confined by the former chiefs of Moy. On a certain evening, in the annals of Moy, the scene is represented as having been one of extreme merriment, for in childbed lay the lady fair, but now is come the appointed hour, and vassals shout, An heir! An heir! It is no ordinary occasion, for a wretched curse has long hung over the castle of Moy, but at last the spell seems broken, and as the well-spiced bowl goes round, shout after shout echoes and re-echoes through the castle. An air! An air! Many a year had passed without the prospect of such an event, and it had looked as if the ill-omened words uttered in the past were to be realised. It was no wonder, then, that in the gloomy towers of Moy there were feasting and revelry, for a child is born who is to perpetuate the clan which hitherto had seemed threatened with extinction. But even on this festive night, when every heart is tuned for song and mirth, there suddenly appears a mysterious figure, a pale and shivering form, 
by age and frenzy haggard maid, who defiantly exclaims, "'Tis vain, tis vain! At once all eyes are turned on this strange form, as she, in mocking gesture, casts a look of withering scorn on the scene around her, and startles the jovial vassals with the reproachful words, "'No air! No air!' The laughter is hushed, the pipes no longer sound, for the witch, with uplifted hand, beckons that she had a message to tell, a message from death. She might truly say, What means these bowls of wine, these festive songs? For the blast of death is on the heath, and the grave yawns wide for the child of Moy. She then recounts the tale of treachery and cruelty committed by a chief of the house of Moy in the days of old, for which his name shall perish for ever off the earth. A son may be born, but that son shall verily die. The witch brings tears into many an eye as she tells how this curse was uttered by one Margaret, a prominent figure in this sad feud, for it was when deceived in the most base manner, and when betrayed by a man who had violated his promise he had solemnly pledged, that she is moved to pronounce the fatal words of doom. She prayed that childless and forlorn the chief of Moy might pine away, that the sleepless night and the careful morn might wither his limbs in slow decay. But never the son of a chief of Moy might live to protect his father's age, or close in peace his dying eye, or gather his gloomy heritage. Such was the curse of Moy, uttered it must be remembered too by a fair young girl, against the chief of Moy for a bloodthirsty crime, the act of a traitor, in that, not content with slaying her father and murdering her lover, he satiates his brutal passion by letting her eyes rest on their corpses. And here, they said, is thy father dead, and thy lover's corpse is cold at his side. Her tale ended, the witch departs. But now ceased the revels of the shuddering clan, for despair had seized on every breast, and in every vein chill terror ran. On the morrow all is changed, no joyous sounds are heard, but silence reigns supreme, the silence of death. The curse has triumphed, the last hope of the house of Moy is gone, and scarce shone the morn on the mountain's head when the lady wept o'er her dying boy. But tyranny, or oppression, has always been supposed to bring its own punishment, as in the case of Barcroft Hall, Lancashire, where the idiot's curse is commonly said to have caused the downfall of the family. The tradition current in the neighbourhood states that one of the heirs to Barcroft was of weak intellect, and that he was fastened by a younger brother with a chain in one of the cellars, and there, in a most cruel manner, gradually starved to death. It appears that this unnatural conduct on the part of the younger brother was prompted by a desire to get possession of the property, and it is added that, long before the heir to Barcroft was released from his sufferings, he caused a report to be circulated that he was dead, and by this piece of deception made himself master of the Barcroft estate. It was in one of his lucid intervals that the poor injured brother pronounced a curse upon the family of the Barcrofts, to the effect that their name should perish for ever and that the property should pass into other hands. But this malediction was only regarded as the ravings of an imbecile, unaccountable for his words, and little or no heed was paid to this death sentence on the Barcroft name. And yet, light as the family made of it, within a short time there were not wanting indications that their prosperity was on the wane, a fact which every year became more and more discernible, until the curse was fulfilled in the person of Thomas Barcroft, who died in 1688 without male issue. After passing through the hands of the Bradshaws, the Pimlots, and the Isherwoods, the property was finally sold to Charles Townley, the celebrated antiquarian, in the year 1795. Whatever the truth of this family tradition, Barcroft is still a good specimen of the later Tudor style, and its ample cellarage gives an idea of the profuse hospitality of its former owners. Some rude scribblings on one of the walls of which are still pointed out as the work of the captive. In a still more striking way, this spirit of persecution incurred its own condemnation. In the seventeenth century, Francis Howgill, a noted Quaker, travelled about the south of England preaching, which at Bristol was the cause of serious rioting. On returning to his own neighbourhood, he was summoned to appear before the justices, 
who were holding a court in a tavern at Kendal, and, on his refusing to take the oath of allegiance, he was imprisoned in Appleby jail. In due time, the judges of assizes tendered the same oath, but with the like result, and evidently wishing to show him some consideration, offered to release him from custody, if he would give a bond for his good behaviour in the interim, which, likewise declining to do, he was recommitted to prison. In the course of his imprisonment, however, a curious incident happened, which gave rise to the present narrative. Having been permitted by the magistrates to go home to Greyrig for a few days on private affairs, he took the opportunity of calling on a justice of the name of Ducket, residing at Greyrig Hall, who was not only a great persecutor of the Quakers, but was one of the magistrates who had committed him to prison. As might be imagined, Justice Ducket was not a little surprised at seeing Howgill, and said to him, "'What is your wish now, Francis? I thought you had been in Appleby jail.' Howgill keenly resented the magistrate's behaviour, promptly replied, "'No, I am not, but I am come with a message from the Lord. Thou hast persecuted the Lord's people, but his hand is now against thee, and he will send a blast upon all that thou hast, and thy name shall rot out of the earth, and this thy dwelling shall become desolate, and a habitation for owls and jackdaws.' When Howgill had delivered his message, the magistrate seems to have been somewhat disconcerted, and said, "'Francis, are you in earnest?' But Howgill only added, "'Yes, I am in earnest. It is the word of the Lord to thee, and there are many living now who will see it.' But the most remarkable part of the story remains to be told. By a strange coincidence, the prophetic utterance of Howgill was fulfilled in a striking manner, for all the children of Justice Ducket died without leaving any issue whilst some of them came to actual poverty, one begging her bread from door to door. Greyrig Hall passed into the possession of the Lowther family, was dismantled, and fell into ruins, little more than its extensive foundations being visible in 1777. And after having long been the habitation of owls and jackdaws, the ruins were entirely removed and a farmhouse erected upon the site of the old hall, in accordance with what was probably known as the Quaker's Curse and its Fulfilment. Cornish biography, however, tells how a magistrate of that county, Sir John Arundel, a man greatly esteemed amongst his neighbours for his honourable conduct, fell under an imprecation which he in no way deserved. In his official capacity, it seems, he had given offence to a shepherd, who had by some means acquired considerable influence over the peasantry, under the impression that he possessed some supernatural powers. This man, for some offence, had been imprisoned by Sir John Arundel, and on his release would constantly waylay the magistrate, always looking at him with the same menacing eye, at the same time slowly muttering these words, When upon the yellow sand thou shalt die by human hand. Notwithstanding Sir John Arundel's education and position, he was not wholly free from the superstition of the period, and might have thought too that this man intended to murder him. Hence he left his home at Efford, and retired to the wood-clad hills of Trevis, where he lived for some years without the annoyance of meeting his old enemy. But in the tenth year of Edward the Fourth, Richard de Vere, Earl of Oxford, seized St. Michael's Mount, on hearing of which news Sir John Arundel, then Sheriff of Cornwall, led an attack on St. Michael's Mount, in the course of which he received his death-wound in a skirmish on the sands near Marazion, Although he had broken up his home at Efford to counteract the will of fate, the shepherd's prophecy was accomplished, and tradition even says that in his dying moments his old enemy appeared, singing in joyous tones, When upon the yellow sand thou shalt die by human hand. The misappropriation of property, in addition to causing many a family complication, has occasionally been attended with a far more serious result. There is a strange curse, for instance, in the family of Mar, which can boast of great antiquity, there being, perhaps, no title in Europe as ancient as that of the Earl of Mar. This curse has been attributed by some to Thomas the Rhymer, by others to the abbot of Cambus Kenneth, and by others to the bard of the house at that epoch. But, whoever its author, the curse was delivered prior to the elevation of the Earl, in the year 1571, to be the regent of Scotland, and runs thus... Proud chief of Ma, thou shalt be raised still higher, until thou sittest in the place of the king. 
Thou shalt rule and destroy, and thy work shall be after thy name. But thy work shall be the emblem of thy house, and shall teach mankind that he who cruelly and haughtily raiseth himself upon the ruins of the holy cannot prosper. Thy work shall be cursed, and shall never be finished. But thou shalt have riches and greatness, and shall be true to thy sovereign, and shalt raise his banner in the field of blood. Then, when thou seemest to be highest, when thy power is mightiest, then shall come thy fall, lo, shall be thy head amongst the nobles of the people, deep shall be thy moan among the children of Dool, sorrow. Thy lands shall be given to the stranger, and thy titles shall lie among the dead. The branch that springs from thee shall see his dwelling burnt, in which a king is nursed, his wife a sacrifice in that same flame, his children numerous, but of little honour, and three born and grown who shall never see the light. Yet shall thine ancient tower stand, for the brave and the true cannot be wholly forsaken. Thou, proud head and daggered hand, must dree thy weird, until horses shall be stabled in thy hall, and a weaver shall throw his shuttle in thy chamber of state. Thine ancient tower, a woman's dower, shall be a ruin and a beacon, until an ash sapling shall spring from its topmost stone. Then shall thy sorrows be ended, and the sunshine of royalty shall beam on thee once more. Thine honours shall be restored. The kiss of peace shall be given to thy countess, though she seek it not, and the days of peace shall return to thee and thine. The line of Mar shall be broken, but not until its honours are doubled, and its doom is ended. In support of this strange curse, it may be noted that the Earl of 1571 was raised to be Regent of Scotland, and guardian of James the Sixth. As regent, he commanded the destruction of Cambus Kenneth Abbey, and took its stones to build himself a palace at Stirling, which never advanced further than the façade, which has been popularly designated Mar's work. In the year 1715, the Earl of Mar raised the banner of his sovereign, the Chevalier James Stuart, son of James the Second or Seventh. He was defeated at the Battle of Sheriff Muir, his title being forfeited, and his lands of Mar confiscated and sold by the government to the Earl of Fife. His grandson and representative, John Francis, lived at a lower tower, which had been for some time the abode of James the Sixth as an infant, where, a fire breaking out in one of the rooms, Mrs. Erskine was burnt and died, leaving, besides others, three children who were born blind, and who all lived to old age. But this remarkable curse was to be further fulfilled, for at the commencement of the present century, upon the alarm of the French invasion, a troop of the cavalry and yeomen of the district took possession of the tower, and for a week fifty horses were stabled in its lordly hall. And in the year 1810, a party of visitors were surprised to see a weaver plying his loom in the grand old chamber of state. Between the years 1815 and 1820, an ash sapling might be seen in the topmost stone, and many of those who clasped it in their hands wondered if it really were the twig of destiny, and if they should ever live to see the prophecy fulfilled. In the year 1822, George the Fourth visited Scotland, and searched out the families who had suffered by supporting the princes of the Stuart line. Foremost of them all was the Erskine of Mar, grandson of Mar, who had raised the Chevalier's standard, and to him the king restored his earldom. John Francis, the grandson of the restored earl, likewise came into favour, for when Queen Victoria accidentally met his countess in a small room in Stirling Castle, and ascertained who she was, she detained her, and after conversing with her, kissed her. Although the countess had never been presented at St. James's, yet, in a marvellous way, the kiss of peace was given to her, though she sought it not. And then, after the curse had worked through three hundred years, the weird dreed out, and the doom of Mar was ended. Another instance which may be quoted relates to Sherborne Castle. According to the traditionary accounts handed down, it appears that Osmond, one of William the Conqueror's knights, who had been rewarded, among other possessions, with the castle and barony of Sherborne, in the decline of life determined to resign his temporal honours, and to devote himself exclusively to religion. In pursuance of this object he obtained the bishopric of Salisbury, to which he gave certain lands, 
but annexed to the gift the following conditional curse. That whosoever shall take those lands from the bishopric, or diminish them in great or small, should be accursed not only in this world, but in the world to come, unless in his lifetime he made restitution thereof. In a strange and wonderful manner, this curse is said to have been more than once fulfilled. Upon Osmond's death, the castle and lands fell into the hands of the next bishop, Roger Niger, who was dispossessed of them by King Stephen, and whose death they were held by the Montagues, all of whom, it is affirmed, so long as they kept these lands, were subject to grievous disasters, insomuch that the male line became altogether extinct. About two hundred years from this time, the lands again reverted to the church, but in the reign of Edward VI, the castle of Sherborne was conveyed by the then Bishop of Sarum to the Duke of Somerset, who lost his head on Tower Hill. Sir Walter Raleigh again obtained the property from the crown, and it was to expiate this offence, it has been suggested, he ultimately lost his head. But, in allusion to this reputed curse, Sir John Harrington gravely tells how it happened one day that Sir Walter, riding post between Plymouth and the court, the castle being right in the way, he cast such an eye upon it as Ahab did upon Naboth's vineyard, and whilst talking of the commodiousness of the place, and of the great strength of the seat, and how easily it might be got from the bishopric, suddenly over and over came his horse, and his very face, which was then thought a very good one, ploughed up the earth where he fell. Then again Prince Henry died shortly after he took possession, and Carr, Earl of Somerset, the next proprietor, fell in disgrace. But the way the latter obtained Sherborne was far from creditable, for, having discovered a technical flaw in the deed in which Sir Walter Raleigh had settled the estate on his son, he solicited it of his royal master, and obtained it. It was in vain that Lady Raleigh, on her knees, appealed to James against this injustice, for he only answered, I mun have the land, I mun have it for car. But Lady Raleigh was a woman of high spirit, and there, on her knees, before King James, she prayed to God that he would punish those who had thus wrongfully exposed her and her children to ruin. She was, in fact, re-echoing the curse uttered centuries beforehand, and that prayer was not long unanswered, for Carr did not enjoy Sherborne for any length of time. Committed to the tower for the murder of Sir Thomas Overbury, he was at last released and restricted to his house in the country, where, in constant companionship with the wife, for the guilty love of whom he had become the murderer of his friend, he passed the remainder of his life, loathing the partner of his crimes, and by her as cordially detested. Spielman goes so far as to say that, all those families who took or had church property presented to them, came, either in their own persons, or those of their descendants, to sorrow and misfortune. One of the many strange occurrences relating to Sir Anthony Brown, standard-bearer to King Henry the Eighth, was communicated some years ago, in connection with the famous Cowdrey Castle, the principal seat of the Montagues. It is said that at the great festival, given in the magnificent hall of the monks at Battle Abbey, on Sir Anthony Brown taking possession of his sovereign's gift of that estate, a venerable monk stalked up the hall to the dais, where Sir Anthony Brown sat, and in prophetic language denounced him and his posterity for usurping the possessions of the church, predicting their destruction by fire and water, a fate which was eventually fulfilled. One of the last Viscounts was, in 1793, drowned when trying to pass the falls of Schaffhausen on the Rhine, accompanied by Mr. Sedley Burdett, the elder brother of the distinguished Sir Francis. They had engaged an open boat to take them through the rapids, but it seems the authorities tried to prevent so dangerous an enterprise, in order, however, to carry out their project, they started two hours earlier than the time previously fixed, four o'clock in the morning, and successfully passed the first or upper fall. But, unhappily, the same good fortune failed them in their next descent, for the boat was swamped and sunk in passing the lower fall, and was supposed to have been jammed in a cleft of the submerged rock, as neither boat nor adventurers ever appeared again. In the same week, the ancient seat of the family, Cowdrey Castle, was destroyed by fire, and its venerable ruins are the significant monument at once of the fulfilment of the old monk's prophecy, and of the extinction of the race of the great and powerful noble. It is further added that the last inheritor of the title, 
the immediate successor and cousin of the ill-fated young nobleman of Schaffhausen, Antony Brown, the last Montague, who died at the opening of this century, left no male issue, and his estates devolved on his only daughter, who married Mr. Stephen Points, a great Buckinghamshire landlord. Some years after their marriage, Mr. Points was desirous of obtaining a grant of the dormant title Viscount Montague, in favour of the elder of his two sons, issue of this marriage, but his hopes were suddenly destroyed by the death of the two boys, who were drowned while bathing at Bognor, the fatal water thus becoming the means, in fulfilment of the monk's terrible denunciation on the family in this fearful curse. In a similar manner the great Tichborne trial followed, it is said, upon the fulfilment, in a manner, of a prophecy respecting that ancient family, made more than seven hundred years before. When the Lady Maybell Tichborne, wife of the Sir Roger, who flourished in the reign of Henry the Second, was lying on her deathbed, she besought her husband to grant her the means of leaving behind her a charitable bequest in the form of an annual dole of bread. To gratify her whim, he accordingly promised her the produce of as much land in the vicinity of the park as she could walk over, while a certain brand was burning, for, as she had been bedridden for many years, he supposed that she would be able to go round only a small portion of the property. But when the venerable dame was carried out upon the ground, she seemed to regain her strength, and, greatly to the surprise of her husband, crawled round several rich and goodly acres, which, to this day, retain the name of the Crawls. On being reconveyed to her chamber, Lady Maybell summoned her family to her bedside, and predicted its prosperity so long as the ancient dole was observed. But she left her solemn curse on any of her descendants who should discontinue it, prophesying that when such should happen, the old house would fall, and the family name become extinct from failure of male issue and she further added that this would be foretold by a generation of seven sons, being followed immediately after by a generation of seven daughters, and no son. The custom of the annual doles was observed for six hundred years on every twenty-fifth of March, until, owing to the complaints of the magistrates and local gentry, that vagabonds, gypsies, and idlers of every description swarmed into the neighbourhood, under the pretence of receiving the dole, it was discontinued in the year 1796. Strangely enough, Sir Henry Tichborne, the baronet of that day, had issue seven sons, and his eldest son, who succeeded him, had seven daughters and no son. The prophecy was apparently completed by the change of name of the possessors of the estate to Doughty, in the person of Sir Edward Doughty, who had assumed the name under the will of a relative from whom he inherited certain property. Finally, it may be added, the claimant appeared, and instituted one of the most costly lawsuits ever tried, in which the Tichborne estate was put to an expense of close upon one hundred thousand pounds. But, occasionally, the effect of a family curse, through the misappropriation of property, has been more sweeping and speedy in its retribution, as in the case of Fervy or Forvy, which now forms part of the parish of Slains, Scotland much, if not most of it, being covered with sand. The popular account of the downfall of this parish tells how, in times gone by, the proprietor to whom it belonged left three daughters as heirs of his fair lands, who were, however, most unjustly bereft of their property and thrown homeless on the world. On quitting their home, their legal heritage, they uttered a terrible curse, which was quickly accomplished, and was considered an unmistakable sign of divine displeasure at the wrong they had received. Before many days had elapsed, a storm of almost unparalleled violence, lasting nine days, burst over the district, and transformed the parish of Forvy into a desert of sand, a calamity which is said to have befallen this district, about the close of the seventeenth century. In this way many local traditions account for the ruined and desolate condition of certain wild and uninhabited spots. Ettrick Hall, for instance, near the head of Ettrick Water, had such a history. On and around its site in former days there was a considerable village, and, as late as the Revolution, it contained no fewer than fifty-three fine houses. But about the year 1700, 
when the numbers in this little village were still very considerable. James Anderson, a member of the Tushalaw family, pulled down a number of small cottages, leaving many of the tenants, some of whom were aged and infirm, homeless. It was in vain that to these poor people appealed to him for a little merciful consideration, for he refused to lend an ear to their complaints, and in a short time a splendid house was built on the property, known as Ettrick Hall. What was considered by the inhabitants far and wide as an act of cruel injustice, incurred its own punishment, for a prophetic rhyme was about the same period made on it, by whom nobody could tell, and which, says James Hogg, writing in the year 1826, has been most wonderfully verified. Ettrick Hall stands on yon plain, right sore exposed to wind and rain, and on it the sun shines never at morn, because it was built in the widow's corn, and its foundations can never be sure because it was built on the ruin of the poor, and o'er an age is come and gain, o'er the trees o'er the chimney taps grow green, we kin a wen where the house has been. The curse that alighted on this fair mansion at length accomplished its destructive work, because nowadays there is not a vestige of it remaining, nor has there been for these many years. Indeed, so complete was the collapse of this ill-fated house, that its site could only be identified by the avenue and lanes of trees while many clay cottages, on the other hand, which were built previously, long remained intact. Equally fatal, also, was the curse uttered against the old persecuting family of home of Caldenose, a place in the immediate neighbourhood of St. Thomas's Castle. Vengeance! Vengeance! When and where? Upon the house of Caldenose, now and evermore. This anathema, awful as the cry of blood, is generally said to have been realised in the extinction of the family, and the transference of their property to other hands. But some doubt, writes Mr. Robert Chambers, seems to hang on the matter. As the Earl of Home, a prosperous gentleman, is a lineal descendant of the Caldenose branch of the family, which acceded to the title in the reign of Charles I, though, it must be omitted, the estate has long been alienated. Love and marriage again have been associated with many imprecations, one of which dates as far back as the time of Edmund, King of the East Angles, in connection with his defeat and capture at Hoxney in Suffolk, on the banks of the Waveney, not far from Eye. The story, as told by Sir Francis Palgrave in his Anglo-Saxon history, is this. Being hotly pursued by his foes, the king fled to Hoxney, and attempted to conceal himself by crouching beneath a bridge, now called Gold Bridge, the glittering of his golden spurs discovered him to a newly married couple, who were returning home by moonlight, and they betrayed him to the Danes. Edmund, as he was dragged from his hiding-place, pronounced a malediction upon all who should afterwards pass this bridge on their way to be married. So much regard was paid to this tradition by the good folks of Hoxney, that no bride or bridegroom would venture along the forbidden path that inconstancy has not always escaped with impunity may be gathered from the following painful story one which if it had not been fully attested would seem to belong to the domain of fiction rather than truth on april the twenty eighth seventeen ninety five a naval court-martial which had lasted for sixteen days and created considerable excitement was terminated the officer tried was Captain Anthony James Pye Malloy, of His Majesty's ship Caesar, and the charge brought against him was that, in the memorable battle of June the 1st, 1794, he did not bring his ship into action and exert himself to the utmost of his power. The decision of the court was adverse to the captain, but having found that on many previous occasions Captain Malloy's courage had been unimpeachable, he was sentenced to be dismissed his ship instead of the penalty of death. It is said that Captain Molloy had behaved dishonourably to a young lady to whom he was betrothed. The friends of the lady wished to bring an action for breach of promise against the captain, but the lady declined doing so, only remarking that God would punish him. Some time afterwards the two accidentally met at Bath, when the lady confronted her inconstant lover by saying, Captain Malloy, you are a bad man. I wish you the greatest curse that can befall a British officer. When the day of battle comes, may your false heart fail you. Her words were fully realised, his subsequent conduct and irremediable disgrace forming the fulfilment of her wish. Another curse, which may be said to have a historic interest, 
has been popularly designated the midwife's curse. It appears that Colonel Stephen Payne, who took a foremost part in striving to uphold the tottering fortunes of the Stuarts, had wooed and won a fair wife amid the battles of the rebellion. The Duke of York promised to stand as godfather to the first child, if it should prove a boy, but when a daughter was born, the Colonel, in his mortification, it is said, formally devoted, in succession, his hapless wife, his infant daughter, himself and his belongings, to the infernal deities. But the story goes that the midwife, Douce Fardon, was commissioned by the shade of Normandy's first duke to announce to her master that not only would his daughter die in infancy, but that neither he nor anyone descended from him would ever again be blessed with a daughter's love. Not many days afterwards the child died, whose involuntary coming had been the cause of the pain curse. Time passed on, and that heaven is merciful, writes Sir Bernard Burke, Stephen Payne experienced in his own person, for his wife subsequently presented him with a son, who was sponsored by the Duke of York by proxy. But six generations of the descendants of Colonel Stephen Payne, it is added, have come and gone since the utterance of the midwife's curse, but they never yet have had a daughter born to them. Such is the immutability of the decrees of fate. End of chapter 1